Now you started off in a in an experimental program at Carnegie um, as a high school student for for kids with high IQs. Yeah, I think it was not, uh, uh, long before I was a high school student. I was eight hmm. or nine years old. I think there was a fashionable development uh, in California. Uh, having to do with the treatment of, of ex extraordinarily bright children who had been uh, sort of uh, ignored. A bright child was qualified as anybody whose IQ was uh, over the 130 range. Mm. Uh, so you were in this program? I was in the program, yeah. And uh, uh, to give you an idea, the, at that point, the, the military uh, regarded anything over 100 as uh, being bright enough to get into the Army. Uh, 102, you could be a colonel. You know? uh, let's see, it was 1925 when I got into that program, and I was born in 1914, so uh, I had to be... Uh, uh, 11? 11 or so. And. Uh, uh, it was a very elaborate program for its time. Uh, we could choose where we wanted to go in the summertime. And uh, for some reason or other, I decided I wanted to be a marine biologist. I mean, I'm an 11-year-old <laughs> marine biologist. But there weren't any classes for children in marine biology, so we went in with the uh, 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 students. I mean, the graduate students, actually. You, you became interested in, in making documentaries, or how did that start? Along the way, I got a, uh, several Rockefeller Fellowships. And uh, the Rockefeller Fellowships, uh, you could choose what you wanted to do, uh, where you wanted to do it, and who you wanted to educate you. I knew a lot of these people socially, uh, insofar as a child can know anybody socially. And uh, so I chose Steiner and Van Dyke, and, who all became uh, uh, celebrated figures in the documentary business and, uh, in effect, interned uh, under them. And I wrote several films, I can't remember what they were, uh, one for the Progressive Education Association, I think that was the first one, called School, which was the story of a very progressive school. I mean, this was really progressive. Most of the people went to jail, actually. <laughs> but it was, it was fun. It was in Concord, New York. These were the days before uh, the emphasis uh, was on the needy and the poor. They were just neglected. And uh, so all these programs were directed at uh, people who were educated and actually were, were, were moneyed. So it was possible to really uh, make all sorts of arrangements. One of my mother's cousins was the owner of Pathé News. So I learned early that the important thing is to have a powerful relative and so I got a job at uh, Pathé News. I, mean, I picked up film from the floor, you know. And, uh, but I learned to cut. I can't remember his name. A very famous German film editor who was an early refugee before the Hitler thing really started. He was smart enough to leave. And he, t he taught me how to, uh, uh, how to cut film, which is like playing multiple chess. I didn't uh, want to be a writer, I just backed into it. Uh, uh, what happened was that uh, uh, I became very good at uh, film editing, so they made me a film editor. Uh, certainly it was the youngest film editor they ever had, I'm sure. In those days, uh, uh, traditionally, uh, the newsreel people were drunks. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, Gable made a film called Too Hot to Handle, which was the biography of, actually the biography of a, 
very well known uh, uh, guy who went around the world shooting wars. I can't remember his name. And uh, uh, the guys who did this were Hemingway type characters, you know. That was the reason for it. And uh, a, a considerable risk. Uh, this gentleman that Gable played was there photographing. And uh, they used IMO cameras in those days, which you wound up. So you had to be very alert because if you didn't wind it up, it wouldn't go. You know? So you had to really try to anticipate what was going to happen. There were no focus devices. The, the operator had to be able to focus by eye, which is quite a trick. You know, you're trying to focus on something 23 feet away, and uh, the focal depth, let's say, is uh, a foot and a half. And somehow you have to be able to do that. Well, a good newsreel cameraman could do that. Very, it was very highly pr uh, paid work because uh, not enough people knew how to do it. Anyway, uh, planes came in and uh, the cameraman uh, was there ready. And there was a woman uh, carrying ducks in a kind of a thing on our shoulders. You've seen those, mm -hmm. uh, four or five ducks, I think. an old lady. And uh, anyway, the bomb went off somewhere nearby, blew her over, and broke the, uh, the cages so the ducks spilled out. And the narrator, the guy who wrote the narration, chose to put in the line and so they duck for cover. So that didn't go down too well with the people who were doing the work. You know? It certainly didn't go down too well with me. This idiot who had written the line, uh, duck for cover, walked into the, the bar. And by that time, everybody was drunk. Drinking was then uh, the sport. I mean, that's what you did. So it seemed perfectly reasonable. I grabbed him and I knocked him down. <laughs> Whoever was in charge of hiring the people who wrote the, uh, wanted to know if I was uh, interested in writing. Uh, I said, well, I never have, but uh, yeah, yeah, fine, whatever, you know. So within about probably two or three months, I became the, the writer of the narration. And, uh, and I was careful not to make fun of anybody. And so that, anyway, that's how I started to, to write. I had no idea that I was going to do anything like that. Pathé had a department where they made industrial films, uh, which were really big commercials. They would be shown at schools. And, uh, like uh, Magnesium Company in America or something like that. So I began to write those things. And they were highly technical, so I began to uh, figure out how to do that. You know? So ultimately, uh, if they wanted something complicated, uh, I'd get hired to do the, the thing. And, uh, and then documentaries became fashionable. I worked for Pale Lorenz who uh, wrote uh, The River and... Uh, and Ralph Steiner? And Ralph Steiner, yeah. I'm trying to remember what it was I did. Well, whatever it was, there was a big picture. A big, uh, you know, it was one of the first star documentaries. And uh, the Museum of Modern Art took hold of it and there was screenings and fashionable and so forth and so on. And I began to do that. It's um, now, you wrote, how, why did you write under a pseudonym, Andrew Holt? Because I was still in the Army and I was moonlighting. And you couldn't uh, work in the Army, be in the Army, and work as a civilian at the same time. So uh, since I was writing with my then wife, 
uh, we chose the name Andrew Holder so we're one person. And uh, uh, that was just to avoid the, the prosecution of some kind. Now, you wrote um, a movie, a few movies with Warner Baxter, and you said, this is so funny, you said, the film, the film story could be anything I chose to invent, providing the store wore a dinner, star wore a dinner jacket and was not obliged to run up or down stairs. That's true. Yeah, he, he had a heart condition, and he, so that was part of his thing. And, uh, and he, in those days, uh, wearing a dinner jacket was very important uh, for even a, an old movie star. So he wore, he wanted to wear a jacket at one point uh, during the show. These were uh, films that usually ran about an hour. They were like, uh, you know, early television. Right. Now, you, in 1947, you did um, Bulldog Drummond Strikes Back? Yeah. I'm told I did. I don't remember <laughs> it. <but laughs> uh, what was Hollywood like when you got there? Just like it is now. Really? Yeah. Do you think the business is the same? Yeah, the reason to make films is the same reason that people make films now, which is to steal from the budget. And uh, the classy people uh, didn't do it because they had other... Jack Ford didn't have to steal from the budget. But it was an accepted practice to this day. For example, uh, there's a film now that has fortunately disappeared called Cohen or Corin or the Ronan. 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 Yeah, yeah. Ronan. Ronan. Uh, the the, uh, the film in real life uh, cost sixty million dollars, and so far and this is I think its fourth week. It's grossed forty, so it's a disaster. Fortunately. And, uh, uh, however, uh, the accounts in the newspapers, uh, it doesn't come out that way. And the, uh, the salaries paid the actors are, of course, grossly exaggerated. And uh, everything is grossly exaggerated. How did the writers fit into the studio system, the early studio system? Or did they? Yeah, well, see, I'd have someone write it, you know. I mean, for years there was a pretense that somehow they got written, you know, but there were writers. But, I, I mean, do you think the studio system, it was better to have a studio system or the way the business is run, you know, after the 50s when the studio system broke down? I don't think it matters. Did you have, did you have control when you, when you were a writer as far as full creative control when you had adapted or created? No, no creative control at all. I worked with people who were intelligent, which is almost as good as having control. Uh, and, uh, and you could deal with them. Like Hal Wallace. I, I, I worked on seven films for Hal Wallace. Uh, and uh, he was a brilliant man and argued my way through all seven films. Uh, he, was, he was unusual, you know. And there were directors who you could deal with. Now, tell me about Panic in the Streets, because that was your first chance on an A film. Because you won an Academy Award for the best motion picture story on that. Yeah. The basis of modern germ war warfare was then, and still is, pneumonic plague. I think it's moved over to nerve gas of some kind, but same idea, lethal. And, uh, and all of a sudden, uh, in this city, name a Indian city uh, that's filthy. Well, they're all filthy, but this one is Calcutta. Calcutta. Uh, there was a big epidemic of... Uh, pneumonic play 
which is like uh, bubonic plague, except it isn't spread by rats or fleas. It's airborne. And that led to the idea of what would happen if uh, someone came into this country with pneumonic plague, which they didn't understand, and uh, started an epidemic. And what would, you know, how would they get? So that was the Jack Palance uh, character. The key person in that whole thing was, uh, was Kazan who got the idea instantly and, of course, had a fight with everybody to get the picture made because he wanted to make it in New Orleans. In those days, they didn't make pictures in the street. They made them in studios. Well, he was Kazan. Anyway, the picture became a runaway success, and everyone in it became a sort of a movie star. Yeah. And let's include the fact that you won the Academy Award. Oh, yeah. Then Edna and I uh, won uh, for the best original uh, story, which uh, uh, I think it was the last time they gave an award to that particular category. So tell me about a typical day as a writer at the studio. Well, uh, the writers began, uh, unless they had special privileges and came from very wealthy families uh, with uh, B pictures. And uh, there were series of, uh, a series of B pictures. Um, they would pay uh, about $500 a week, uh, which was a lot of money then. Always the producer uh, served under uh, a lead producer, a head producer, who was an old veteran. His name was usually Kelly or something like that. And the, the uh, younger producer uh, would serve under the, uh, the head of the unit. The unit probably would uh, be making three or four of these series films, like The Crime Doctor's Diary. Or they liked the writers who uh, were able to write the same story over and over again and just change the names, it made it easier. And it was uh, nothing, you know, this kid stuff. The individual producers who might have two or three films going at the same time, it would take about 12 days to shoot a film. I mean, they, were, they went fast, you know. So did you have an office on the lot, or how did, how did that work? How did the writers collaborate? I had an office and a, and a secretary. Every studio had a bar, I mean, a favorite bar. Uh, Paramount was Oblats. They installed, installed the telephone system in the bar so that if someone wanted you as the writer, where is Ann Hall? Yeah. I'll connect you. you know. They connected you with the bar. <laughs> and, but nobody ever got on to that. You know. And uh, so eventually, uh, Big conferences were held in the bar because everybody was there. I remember being in the bar and, uh, when Wayne and, and, and Marshall were having a conference that went on and on and on, and they got drunker and drunker and drunk, and finally no one could remember what it was they were trying to get to. You know? Where did you get some of your ideas? Yeah, cheap ideas. I mean, <laughs> you could get those ideas very easily. No, it's, it's not a big trick having those ideas. The Magic Mountain, it might be a little problem, but uh, I don't know. I didn't have any problems, nor did anybody I know have any problem. How about uh, writer's block? What, what could be blocking? I mean, there was nothing there. <laughs> I mean, we're not writing the story of, uh, you know, the veil of somebody or... Uh, and nobody was writing very seriously about serious things. Today, nobody's writing very seriously about serious things. What was one of the best writing experiences you had? Well, I guess uh, The Man in the Glass Booth, because that was a very original uh, 
thinking. Beckett was very original material, and of course Beckett is totally fraudulent, uh, historically it's inaccurate. Inaccurate. It's it's false, but uh, it works. But it's not a documentary, so that's. Well, except it happened. Uh, I mean, the, there are uh, there are historical records. Uh, Thomas a Beckett uh, uh, was a Norman, as was the king. And uh, unlike the film. Uh, where Thomas a Becket was a Saxon and, and the enemy of the king. He wasn't. He was, I suspect, the lover of the king. But it didn't play that way. So uh, they became enemies, political enemies, and eventually uh, the king killed him. But it didn't happen that way at all. So but that's a distortion. And how, uh, and how come you chose to, to change it? Well, because if the archbishop uh, had been a Norman, as the king was, uh, their, their quarrel, their enmity, would have had to been personal. And the only, the only thing I could think of uh, was the homosexuality, which in those days uh, so I had to make it political. You also won you won an Academy Award for yeah I don't think anybody knew that it wasn't uh, factual. Well, I think one of your quotes when you talked about this project was you said the problem is to keep it from being a play, from being theatrical. How did you deal with that when you were adapting um, to keep it? You know, you know how certain films do have a theatrical look. How did you, how did you deal with that as a writer? You should play it for real. I mean, the, the dialogue and the attitudes of the people uh, were real uh, attitudes. The king could not stand his wife. And he hated his own children. And he wasn't at all hesitant about expressing it. Well, uh, it's, that's not theater. I mean, this is really uh, movies as they are today. I mean, the, 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 uh, uh, the dialogue was, it was a, a very ordinary dialogue. I mean, it was not. It wasn't poetic dialogue. People don't speak poetically. Uh, it worked. Yeah. Tell me about the sniper. This must have been at the beginning of the Korean War. Fifty-two. Fifty-two, yeah. Because I remember uh, driving down to uh, San Diego to see some benighted person off on a troop ship and uh, I remember that there was a, a guy painting a smokestack, big smokestack, painting it you know? and uh, fell off, fell off the smokestack but he had a safety thing on and that caught him. And somehow, uh, I got the idea that if somehow I could tie that up for some reason for him to be there, it would be a, uh, a dramatic thing. You know, I had no general ideas about it. And I'm trying to think how we got to the censorship part of it. Oh, it was the sniper who shot the guy. Uh, on the thing, right? And uh, uh, the sniper was the, uh, an early uh, s serial killer. He got his kicks uh, by shooting women. And in real life, did. There was 
the legal case that over the picture, uh, the, the guy actually shot three or four women in, in Canada. And uh, everybody sued Columbia Pictures and me and everybody. Uh, but it didn't work. They, 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 the, the Canadian Supreme Court decided that uh, you cannot hold the artist responsible for what the artist dreams up. He wasn't trying to kill anybody. You know. How did the Hays Code fit in? Well, uh, when they decided to make the movie, see what happened is uh, Ed and I wrote, because Panic in the Streets had worked, so we sat down and wrote uh, this thing called The Sniper about a guy who gets off by shooting women. And since the, the, they had paid handsomely for uh, the other one, did they pay for this? Well, they did. So it was an early uh, epiphany that I had. You can actually get $75,000 for eight hours work. I mean, <laughs> so I realized that to do anything else was just stupid. So, uh, so we sat down and wrote this uh, little story. Went to the uh, Breen office. By that time, it was the Breen office. Joe Breen was running it. And by that time, Joe Breen and I had become drinking buddies. So, when I showed up with this thing, they had already written saying, forget it, this is not the subject for a motion picture. Why isn't it the subject for a motion picture? Because it, 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 it dealt with what they call perversion, which was not the subject, where you could not make a film about homosexuality, period. It's forbidden. So. Uh, so when I got permission to approach the board with a plea, Breen said, what are you wasting everybody's time for? It says here you can't do this. So he said, what excuse do you have? You're wasting everybody's time. And I said, uh, this is not about homosexuality. He said, what are you talking about? The guy gets off shooting women. I said, no. If he got off shooting men, that would be homosexual. <laughs> well, it's a wonderful way. <laughs> it works. <laughs> and how, how they rationalized all that, I don't know, but the picture got made. <laughs> when you had a story that you were adapting, did you have um, a star or a person, certain person in mind? Well, usually there was an actor involved, yes. But while you're writing? When you, when you come up with a, a writing idea or when you were, even when you were adapting, was there somebody you already knew of or thought of? Yeah, almost always. The, the actor was already cast. They were all under contract. You know? So the assignments were given, the writing assignment was given after the casting? Yeah. The, the producers knew who they wanted in the, uh, to, play the, to play the role. What did you think of the casting in, in The Pride and the Passion? I thought it was ridiculous, but <laughs> poor, poor Sinatra, I mean, he's, well, he was only there on a pass. He, he wanted to be close to Ava, who, he had ju who had just divorced him. So he took the job. That's about what it was. And of course, the most improbable uh, Guerriero that I've ever seen. Did you, did, you did, you have, did you complain about that or anything along those no. lines? Why would I, you know, argue with the producer? Who was so happy, he got Cary Grant, and Sophia Loren, and Frank, and uh, they lived happily ever after. He didn't, he didn't live too happily ever after because in that film, uh, the uh, climax occurs with this group of uh, uh, guerrilleros. Uh, taking the city of Avila uh, from the French. Uh, I guess it was the biggest scene that had ever been shot up to that point. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I mean, we had 
and there'd be 2,000 extras. And a lot of fireworks. A lot of people got hurt shooting it. At the end of the picture, uh, Avila is presumably was taken by Sinatra and his group. And uh, meanwhile, Cary Grant has fallen in love with Sophia Loren, which actually happened. Frank had no real interest in any of this, except he wanted to be there because of Ava. So he was doing what he could. Anyway, the moment came when uh, he had to carry uh, Sophia Loren, who had been wounded, uh, through into the city before the statue of uh, Santa Teresa uh, as sort of a sacrificial figure. And nobody thought about this, but when it came time, uh, uh, Sophia was probably 19 or 20, it was a, a good, healthy 150 pounds. And Frank it was whatever he was and weighed seven pounds. And <laughs> so he couldn't lift her. <laughs> it was pretty funny. Everybody's standing around, he can't lift her. So I had to rewrite it quickly. And uh, uh, Cary Grant ended up lifting her and carrying her into the city. <laughs> but it was funny. That's a good one. That is good. Uh, on, on your pictures, be, or beforehand, did you, how much research did you do on your projects? Well, I found out that uh, uh, you could make most of it up because nobody would read it anyway. There were two books written uh, by the uh, French officers who conducted the war for the French. Very good military books. And I got fascinated reading, because this was real. I mean, this is, they, it was like reading today's military. Uh, so that became interesting stuff. And I made it as accurate as I could. But normally, I wouldn't bother. How long would it take you to write a, a first draft? Well, that was a complicated uh, picture. That took about six or seven months. And then a final polish? It was usually done by the producer or somebody, his nephew. <laughs> How much time did you spend on the set? Almost no time at all. They never, never wanted writers on the set. Got everybody nervous. Would you change that today? No, I wouldn't let a writer on the set. How come? It's a different. It's a different profession. Uh, whatever has to be done can be done in the script. And as far as, uh, unless the writer is a director. For example, David Mamet is a director. Obviously, I would want David Mamet on the set. But uh, unless he is a director and understands how to do it, uh, he's in the way. You can, you can write it down. It's just, I never uh, made a big thing about being on the set. How, um, when you're taking on a project, because you took on some, some pretty heavy duty projects, how, what was your process of, of adapting a project? When you uh, read a novel, you get sleepy. And you put the novel down and you go to sleep. Uh, well, you can't get sleepy when you're uh, watching a, a novel being done in, uh, on television or in, a, in film. I mean, the audience has to be alert. Otherwise, uh, you know, it, it doesn't work at all. So. Uh, and the audience uh, has to be juiced all the time. And that requires some artificial respiration. Tell me about um, your adaptation process, say, with Beckett. Well, I do outlines. Uh, how I write it down in, in outline form. Uh, one, two, three, four, what happens, 
and um, I can usually tell whether it's going to work or not. Yeah. Uh, most writers probably, uh, I imagine, uh, write uh, outlines. Otherwise, how do they know where they're going? Yeah. Once in a while, uh, you get some sort of inspiration, which comes, you know, where I don't know. But, for example, uh, the man in the glass booth. There was something wrong with the man in the glass booth. I, I had seen the play in London, and there was something wrong with it. I didn't figure out what it was. And, and I realized uh, after some conversations with uh, Bob Shaw that he, he had never used the full potential of that plot. He had, uh, he had a gold in his hand and he apparently didn't know it. And uh, because he wrote his play, it was, began as a novel. Uh, his play and the novel uh, were about the guilt of a concentration camp survivor who feels guilty because he survived. Not an uncommon thing. In fact, s such a not uncommon thing that it was a cliché. But what he had in his hand, which he apparently didn't realize, was he had a, uh, he had a man who had serious mental problems and identified with the Christ figure. And uh, he died uh, because he believed uh, that in dying he would save others. And uh, so I, ch I changed it. He became uh, the end of the picture, he's clearly a Christ figure. He dies as though on a crucifix. And it worked. Apparently, people understood that. Uh, it was... Uh, How did you work with Robert Shaw on that, then? I didn't. The minute he found out what I was doing, he had a complete shit fit and wouldn't talk to me. However, when he saw the film, finally, he phoned me and apologized, which was... That's great. Um, ha going back to Beckett for a moment. Now, if you were going, if you had a play or a novel, tell me about, uh, if you read a novel, how would you decide which pieces you kept, which pieces you... Well, let's take uh, Young Lions. First, you have to decide what it is that you're trying to say. Uh, which what isn't always what the novelist is trying to say, usually not. Uh, so I, I had to decide what, what I wanted to say about each of the three men uh, in the film. Marlon's character, Dean Martin's character, Hardenberg, who has been in a number of films that I've written, uh, Max Schell, and, uh, and above all, uh, the Noah Ackerman character played by Monty Clift. So uh, I had to decide whether uh, the characters as they were in the novel uh, were the ones that I really wanted. I changed them. Uh, they, they weren't... Uh, uh, Brando's character. He began life in the story uh, as a Nazi. And he began to, uh, to change. And in the end, of course, uh, uh, he really uh, he killed himself. And in the original Erwin Shaw story, he's a Nazi until the end. Yeah, he got worse. Uh, 
the, the, the character is really quite true, at least in my experience, uh, uh, was uh, uh, the uh, uh, Monty Cliff character. Because that's a, s a pure story of anti-Semitism in the military. And, and real. I mean, I was, saw a lot of that. And uh, in the end, he, uh, he triumphed. Before you came on the scene, eight people had produced 13 unusable scripts. I just ignored them. Because the, uh, the producer, uh, who I respected, said, just don't read these. It didn't make any sense. Yeah. Okay. I didn't read any of it. So when you are when you're looking at something, can you look at a at a novel and know immediately? Can you read a novel and know immediately what you're going to cut? Not immediately, but I, I can think it through. I can see where it doesn't work. What kind of environment did you did you write in? I mean, what? Um, I know we've talked about a typical day, but what kind of, what did you need around you? What tools did you need, if, if anything? What did you like to have in your writing environment? Yeah. <laughs> Plenty of booze. <laughs> this stuff is not written dry. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's no accident that uh, the great screenwriters that, that I was brought up with uh, John Lee Mann. All these guys were drunks. They couldn't possibly have done it if they'd been sober. Which leads me to whose work do you think you learned from? Who shaped your writing? Uh, I, I think uh, John Lee more than anybody else. He was a uh, brilliant guy. He just knew. You know. uh, of course, uh, I don't know any current screenwriters. The ones I know are either all dead or, or, or unemployed. But uh, my feeling is that the, the writers that I knew who were a generation or half a generation uh, ahead of me uh, were highly educated men. I mean, academically educated. Whereas the ones that I have banged into around town is, I don't know what's, you know. I mean, I can't believe, that, I, I don't believe anybody wrote Cronin, is that the name of it? Ronan? Ronan. I found out later that, <laughs> that uh, uh, the man I, I just mentioned that I like so much actually wrote it and took his name off it, David Mamet. David Mamet wrote it, obviously recoiled in horror and took his name off the screen. <laughs> now, didn't you work with, um, did you work with Sidney Pollack? Well, I did on, once on Jeremiah Johnson, mm. yes. That's what it was. Redford and Sidney Pollack, yeah. yeah. Now, Jeremiah Johnson is a true story. Uh, much truer than uh, you have any indication from the existing uh, film. Uh, uh, Jeremiah Johnson was a maniac uh, who was buried uh, in uh, right here in Westwood in the Veterans Cemetery. He married a, a, a Crow Indian lady. Uh, well, he was a, a refugee from the, uh, from the Civil War, uh, went up into the mountains to hunt, to sell pelts and so forth, and uh, went up there and had a rough time, really wasn't a mountain man, didn't know how to fish, didn't know how to do any of those things, the way Robert Redford, who was a naturalist and understood those things and was good at it, but, uh, but he went up there without any real skills and uh, he just got lost, he was uh, impossible, but he was... Uh, he, s he stayed at it and finally learned enough to survive and marry an Indian marriage, uh, this Crow Indian lady. And uh, 
in the course of uh, his various adventures, uh, uh, the army, the Union army, he hated. Uh, he would have hated any army, but I mean, he particularly hated the Union. I, I came up there, and these guys were uh, fundamentalists, oddly enough. And uh, uh, it made life difficult for him. Uh, meanwhile, he had become sort of a volunteer caretaker of uh, the Indian cemeteries. The Indians exposed the bodies on trees. They were eaten by birds. It was the, that's what they did. And uh, so he guarded the bodies. And uh, at one point, this Union group, this is all, this has really happened, uh, wanted to uh, make a shortcut through this cemetery because some of their people were down below and were suffering. Uh, he didn't want them to go. He said, no, it's my responsibility, and so forth and so on. Uh, they went anyway. And uh, he uh, uh, took a dim view of it, and uh, uh, he, he fought them over it, and uh, they attacked him, the soldiers did. And he... Uh, they killed his wife. And child, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And a child. And so he, he became uh, vengeful. Not only did he kill them, but he would cut out their livers and eat them on the spot. You know, uh, what, is, what is the word in there? Whatever it was, his ceremony. He, he, uh, he killed a lot of them. Yeah. So how? I mean, you you know, you say a lot of the things were factual, and yet you have to make a choice of of what you're going to retain, what you're going to well, weave in. How did I you cut out the liver because I remember the conversation with with uh, the actor who was determined to be real. He wanted to be real. He really killed these uh, 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 Union soldiers and, uh, and ate their livers. Uh, so I argued with him and I said, look, movie stars can't eat people's livers. It's, <laughs> it's just as nice. You know? So anyway, I talked him out of it. So. Uh, uh, but in real life, he kept eating the livers. How much? How much power did you did you have on something in a situation like that between the actor and the director? How much? I, I don't want to say power, but how much input did you have on something along those lines? Well, if I b believed it seriously enough, and I was uh, articulate enough, uh, you have as much as you can get. You know? Did they give you, at that time, did you get studio notes back? Did they give you notes from the executives that came down about a film? No, the only, the only notes I ever got in my life were from David Selznick. Those must have been interesting. Yeah, they went on and on and on. The great moment in Madame X for me uh, was when the, uh, the girl who played the, the lady who played the, the lead, whose name I can't remember, but, Anyway, she played uh, Madame X, a very good actress, but I can't remember her name. And uh, I was the judge, so I had all the, the big heads making, you know, various judgments. And uh, she sat next to the camera, and of course, fed me the lines. And. Uh, trying to get it to be as real as possible. And uh, apparently I was pretty stiff. So at one point, uh, the director said, whatever they say, what do they say, roll it. And uh, they rolled it. And uh, 
she walked into the, uh, the, uh, the place where she was supposed to be for me to be seeing her and flash me. <laughs> and of course the camera was on me. It's a funny scene. I need to go back and watch that. Um, Tuesday Well. Tuesday Well. Yeah, yeah, ah, yeah. okay. Um, let's talk about, I'm curious about the Boston Strangler. Tell me about working on that. Because that's, that's pretty, you treated the material in a very straightforward way. Yeah, it's based on uh, what had actually happened. That wasn't made up, I mean, it was, uh, uh, what, what, what attracted you to that project? What, what made that interesting to you? The director is an old friend of mine. I got along with him very well. That was, that's what attracted me more than anything else. Uh, also, uh, Tony Curtis is an old friend of mine. And Tony Curtis, I think, is probably the most underrated actor in town. It always has been. Uh, so that's what attracted me. Uh, also, uh, his uh, his M.O., the actual M.O. of the, of the guy, uh, was, uh, it was very real. He, he uh, well, one little, uh, Illumination, which will tell you the whole story. Uh, uh, John Bottomley, who was the state attorney, who was the chief interrogator, the chief investigator, uh, made a deal with F. Lee Bailey. Everybody was always making a deal with F. Lee Bailey. Uh, that if uh, Bottomley could put him away, put uh, the Curtis character away forever. They wouldn't prosecute him for the homicides. There were 13 homicides. Because all the prosecutor wanted to do was to get him off the streets and make the audience believe it. You know, because the women were getting killed every day. So, uh, He set up a situation where he was taping everything uh, legally. Uh, he made a deal with the with the uh, uh, F. Lee Bailey that it would never be used. But he, the prosecutor, would know, and the press would know. So uh, there's one scene, uh, which I've seen on tape, where. Uh, he says to uh, uh, the actor, uh, how did you choose your victims? And he says, wherever I could park. So the, the bottom, he couldn't believe it. He said, you mean the woman would go upstairs and you could park there so you'd kill her? He said, yeah. yeah. And that was, it turned out uh, in, in, uh, uh, when he was finally murdered, uh, the, the character was murdered. Uh, he was killed in a, a homosexual quarrel in the toilet, that's where it always happens. Uh, when he finally was uh, done away with, uh, and they did autopsies, uh, and they did a brain thing, so on, they found out that that uh, uh, the Tony Curtis character was very, very unusual psychologically. I mean, so much so that there may be five or six cases in the history of this kind of jurisprudence, uh, which is he was what's called polymorphous perverse. And uh, whatever it was that he could imagine was sufficiently odd 
he would do and enjoy it. Polymorphous, perverse. But writing for somebody who's, who was then called schizophrenic would be, how, how did, I mean, that seems so difficult to me. Well, schizophrenia is a very misunderstood disease. For some reason or other, uh, the audience and the people who make the movies think of schizophrenia as uh, the split uh, image thing, you know. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Paul Newman's wife did one. For whatever reason, the audience, uh, probably because the medical books misled them, uh, led everybody to believe that schizophrenia is the split personality thing. In fact, it isn't. Uh, schizophrenia is, is a state of mind uh, in which the victim or the, the patient escapes somewhere. Nobody knows where. They're just not there. My mother was a schizophrenic. And uh, she just wasn't there. Never found out where she was, but she wasn't there. And that's what schizophrenia is. It's not tricky about dual personalities or anything like that at all. What resources did you use? Well, uh, there was a book by, I can't remember the name of the book, or the writer who just died two weeks ago, uh, which was a very uh, uh, academic, uh, very good account of the whole story. Uh, that was the principal resource, uh, and uh, the press, uh, which uh, the distortions of the press were in themselves, uh, uh, plus the, uh, the fact that I was with the cops a lot of the time. And uh, I, I could see where they were going, you know. And, uh, Every once in a while, it got so crazy, I would interfere, say, fellas, you know, just because he's gay doesn't mean he wants to kill everybody. You know? With all the material and different accounts, how did you go through the material and sort it out and decide what you were going to use? Well, the stuff that was the juiciest. It wasn't always true, you know. After all, the purpose of this is to get people to pay to see the movie. What was the most important resource you used? The cops. The cops have no conscience. I mean, it's not, they, they wouldn't be cops if they had a conscience. So they don't, they don't think of it in the terms that civilians do. Uh, they want to get the guy, and uh, make as little trouble as possible, and don't get into trouble themselves, but uh, they're not moralists. You know, they're how long? So, how long did it take you to get everything together and 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 write it, adapt it? Around four months, I think. Writing it is, is not a problem. Writing is not a problem. It's preparing that's the problem. All the the research and the yeah. Well, what do you? What is there? Is there a secret? Is there a, a secret that you have for your writing style or your ability to adapt or? have to be talented. I mean, all the instruction, you know, is, I mean, I've taught in these schools, you know. <laughs> you can't teach anybody to write, even on the write you can't write. But you can, you can look at somebody's work and tell, tell if they're a good writer. Well, I can tell if it works. You know, I can see where they, they've gone wrong, in my opinion. Uh, but, uh, and there are certain writers if you pick up anything that uh, the guy I was talking about, who wrote the, the, the Japanese uh, uh, Spanish prisoner. David Mamet? Mamet. You don't have to be a, you know, a genius to pick up anything that Mamet has written. And you can say, hey, it's a guy who really knows what he's doing. Yeah. Of course, you can tear it up and do it all over again. That's the interesting thing about writing, is you just tear it up and do it again. Yeah. What, what was your hardest project then? Pardon? What was your toughest project? My happiest project? Your toughest, the hardest. The, 
the thing that I just uh, uh, escaped from, the Streisand project, uh, which was the story of Arafat and Rabin. And we had a lot of difficulty with the producers, really, not with the subject matter. You said your favorite was The Man in the Glass Booth, your favorite project. That was The, the Man in the Glass Booth's a favorite project because it, I was able to escalate it from uh, a fairly ordinary story. If I explained to you of uh, a guilty concentration camp survivor, which has been done before, uh, to a Christ character. who finds it necessary uh, to, uh, to sacrifice himself uh, in the interest of those who are remaining, watching. I mean, it's the Christ story. That doesn't mean that I believe the story, because I personally, and I've written a number of these, biblical things, uh, regard it uh, as all mythology. Uh, I think that, that uh, uh, Abraham, the first Jew, was as crazy as Jesus. I think they were both schizoid. Uh, but that doesn't mean it isn't fascinating. It came about through uh, uh, Doug Kramer who was the producer. And uh, who wanted to do a miniseries. And, you know, the idea being that uh, you could run a thing for four nights and it would work. You know? No, it did. It's a good story. Remember, the, the, the story uh, is about an anti-Semitic Jew. That's what the basic story is. Zach doesn't get cleaned up either. In a situation like that, it would be a different format for you. How was it writing for something like that? It was easy. I mean, everybody connected was talented. I didn't have any problems. Well, you wrote most of these things on your own, did you not? Or did, yes. was there collaboration? Mostly on my own. Yeah. You don't have to take everybody into consideration. You know? That didn't work out. It ended in a divorce. The, 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 I remember being on the air in Madrid. Uh, the name of the film in Spanish was Orgia y Pasione, Pride and the Passion, the Pride and the Passion. And the interrogator uh, said to me, I read in the paper that uh, you know, you're, you're, being, you're getting a divorce. I said, you know, in those days they had the same, you know. I said, yeah. So he said, what happened? I said, dos mas uh, Orgia, and uh, uh, Picunia, <laughs> uh, uh, passione, too much, too much pride and too little passion. Doing this kind of thing is a way of making a living. And some people do it easily and some people don't. Do the best you can and, and hopefully it'll work. Have powerful relatives. And number two would be? <laughs> More powerful relatives. <laughs>